Welcome back. Uh, we're going to now discuss government enforced racial segregation. How did we get to the map that you saw in the introduction? This is sort of the history of how we have arrived to that point today. So you can see in some ways, or Baltimore is very interesting. It started out after the Civil War, which was from 1861 to 1865. Here in America, over 600,000 people died in that war, which did end the enslavement of African-American people. Just two years later, in 1867, Baltimore City Council passed an ordinance allowing opening the city's public schools to African-Americans. And so at that point, you actually had segregated education system here in Baltimore and other places around America, too. And this would not really be undone until Brown versus Board of Education, roughly 90 years later in 1954. So the first colored high school was opened, and colored was a term that was used at that point in time. It wasn't black. It wasn't African-American. At that point in time, it was people were often called colored here in America if they were non-white. And so the first colored high school was opened in 1882 by the Baltimore City Public School System. Colored schools were operated by the system from 1867, as I mentioned earlier, to 1954. So this is quite a while. We've actually had segregated school system longer than we've had an integrated school system here in Baltimore City. And the black schools are actually white run until 1898 and 1899, when due to the advocacy of black teachers and black community leaders like Reverend Harvey Johnson, who led the fight for black teachers to teach black children here in the Baltimore City school system. So here we see a picture of Colored School Number 9, as it was called, which opened in 1889 at 1431 North Cary Street. And I believe that building actually still stands today. And so just to give you a backdrop, of sort of how segregation was woven into the fabric of the educational system early on in Baltimore. Now, in 1896, there was a pivotal Supreme Court decision called Plessy versus Ferguson, in which the Supreme Court of the United States actually said that separate but equal is the law of the land. And so at that point, Jim Crow, which is a, a nickname for American segregation, is actually authorized and fully allowed by law. And so 1896, before the turn of the century in 1900, what we have is segregated education system. There were segregated transportation systems. And then the Supreme Court decision really sort of validating this sort of move to keep people separate here in America. And so here are some of the policies that actually led to segregation in housing. So we're, we're sort of moving from education. We talked just briefly about transportation. Now we're here talking about housing. So there's racial zoning, racially restrictive covenants, redlining, racially segregated public housing, and segregated public schools. These are all policies and practices that sort of sorted and separated people here in Baltimore City. So let's go through those. Racial zoning was passed by Mayor J. Barry Mahool on December the 20th, 1910. And in doing so, Baltimore City became the first city in the United States to pass a comprehensive racial zoning law. And if you read Garrett Power in his 1983 paper um, from which this presentation is really named, his paper being called Apartheid Baltimore Style, he actually writes, many progressives thus agreed that poor blacks should be quarantined in isolated slums in order to reduce the incidence of civil disturbance, to prevent the spread of communicable disease into nearby white neighborhoods, and to protect property values among the white majority. So these are actually the three main rationale that were used to justify racial segregation. So to reduce civil disturbances, because at that time there were many race riots in the United States. As a matter of fact, 1919, there was many race riots in what was called the Red Summer of 1919. 1921, I believe, that was when Tulsa's black community was destroyed by all types of violence uh, from the white community there. And then in 1923, Rosewood, Florida was wiped out, a black city in Florida. 
And so when they're saying civil disturbance, they're saying, well, we don't want that type of racial conflict happening in our city. Of course, at that time, racial conflict usually meant the destruction of black communities. So that's number one. Number two is the spread of communicable disease. So actually, you can see public health is invoked as a justification for racial segregation. And that's really key to realize that our field, public health, can be used to actually justify a bad social policy. And I think that's something that we'll have to grapple with in our field now and historically and moving forward. So then there's also the rationale of protecting property values, which is actually, you still hear that in many ways today. If you watch a show called uh, Show Me a Hero by TV producer David Simon, this show references people wanting to protect their property values when public housing residents are moving into their neighborhood in Yonkers, New York. So this refrain, you hear that sort of justification over and over again. Now, thankfully, this was outlawed by the Supreme Court in 1917 in the decision called Buchanan versus Worley. Unfortunately, there would be more policies. Now, here you can see uh, the New York Times article that was published on December the 25th, 1910. And it says Baltimore tries drastic plan of race segregation. Strange situation, if you look at the subtitle, which led to the Oriole City to adopt the most pronounced Jim Crow measure on record. And in the middle, you can see Baltimore Mayor J. Barry Mahool. To his left, you can see black lawyer George McMeekin. And he was the gentleman that moved into this house, 1834 McCullough Street, which still stands today, which was a white block at the time. And when he moved in, it spurred those ordinances that Baltimore pioneered. So after that, 1910, Edward Bowden of the Roland Park Company, he pioneered racially restrictive covenants. And the Roland Park Company developed several neighborhoods here in Baltimore City, Roland Park, Guilford, Homeland, and the original Northwood community. And so they all had these racially restrictive covenants. The deeds to the home would say, you cannot sell this home to a Negro or a Jew. Negro was the term that was in Vogue at the time for African-Americans and to the Jewish population, they were also segregated as well. In fact, Baltimore, if you read Antero Batella's Not in My Neighborhood, had a three-tiered segregation system with whites at the top, Jews in the middle, and then African-Americans at the bottom. So the Roland Park Company uh, was in competition with the Forest Park Company, and they also had racially restrictive covenants uh, in Forest Park and Ashburton. Thankfully, these were struck down by the Supreme Court in Shelley versus Kramer in 1948, but there was hardly any enforcement. So, in fact, these would still be used after that time period. And you can actually, if you see, have a chance to visit some homeowners in those neighborhoods and you ask to see their restrictive covenants, you can still see the language that excludes racial categories to this day. They're just not allowed by law. So. After 1912, when there's racially restrictive covenants, and actually those communities, Roland Park, Guilford, had been built by 1912, they were actually not a part of Baltimore City until 1918, when they merged to become a part of Baltimore City, when there was annexation. So to be clear, this doesn't become a part of Baltimore City's landscape until 1918. So we talked about Mayor J. Barry Mahool. He was the first to pass the racial zoning. Then after he stepped down, we had Mayor James Preston. He was mayor. He helped pass more of those ordinances because the first one didn't stand up in court. But he also, towards the end of his mayoralty, of course, was involved in those racially restrictive covenants. He was mayor when that annexation happened. And so... Mayor James Preston sought to utilize a public-private conspiracy to maintain de facto segregation after Buchanan versus Worley. He went to Chicago to learn more about the Chicago plan for segregation. Well, after he was mayor, uh, four years later, Mayor Howard Jackson was elected to the first of his two segments that he served in office. And he formed in 1923 a committee for segregation. So you can see, and this is all discussing Garrett Power's paper, Apartheid Baltimore Style, you can see that there are multiple ways by which 
the white leadership of the city at the time is actually looking to enforce segregation. So this is not just happenstance. This is very, very intentional. Then there's the policy of redlining, which is really based on the four colors that the homeowners loan corporation used to sort of distinguish which type of communities they would insure mortgages in order to allow lending to take place. So the lending at the time was really restricted to racial categorizations. If you read Inter Patella's Not in My Neighborhood, How Bigotry Shaped a Great American City, he talks about the ways in which racial groups were ranked in order of who could live in certain neighborhoods. So in green and blue, you could have white Anglo-Saxons. And then in blue, you had the Jewish community who could not move into the green. In the yellow, you would have maybe recent European immigrants, uh, maybe coming from Poland, Czechoslovakia, uh, Romania, Russia. Uh, We had a quite a few uh, immigrants coming from places like that. And maybe they moved into those yellow communities when they first moved over. And then in red, African-Americans were restricted to living in those communities. So there's a racial hierarchy. And he says in his books, it's influenced by the pseudo racial science of eugenics. And so the federal housing administration actually sanctions this behavior because they offered insurance to homes that were in grade A, B, and maybe C communities, those green, blue, and yellow communities, but they did not offer them for communities in grade D or red. These are actually called residential security maps, and they would be struck down later in 1968, both by the Supreme Court and by Congress in the 1968 Fair Housing Act. And as you can see on this map, you have this grade A B, C, and D communities. And just to the east and west of the center of the map are red communities. And that's where in 1937, when this map was drawn, African Americans lived here in Baltimore City. So next we see segregated public housing was a tool of racial segregation. The Housing Authority of Baltimore City was actually created in 1937 while Howard Jackson was still mayor. And five public housing units were built, Perkins, Latrobe, McCullough, Douglas, and Poe. And they were racially segregated. Perkins and Latrobe were white public housing units. McCullough, Douglas, and Poe were the designated black public housing units. So again, racial segregation is reinforced by policy. And it would later be determined in the 1990s and 2000s in a court case called Thompson versus Hood. It would be shown that Many of the outlying regions actually sent their low income black population to Baltimore City and they ended up living in public housing. So because even the surrounding counties and surrounding regions where they were also segregated and reinforcing their segregation by removing their black population and sending them to black public housing in Baltimore City. So in 1954. Brown versus Board was handed down by the Supreme Court of the United States in May. So in September and October, when schools opened, there were protests against desegregation. And you can see some of the signs that these very, very young people are holding. And you can see in the middle, right above the cop, there's someone holding the sign. We want equal but segregation. And there's another student in the tie a little bit to the left. You can see him holding a sign saying, keep city schools white. And so people were actually fighting to maintain a racial segregation. You can see that also here in the protest on October the 9th, 1954. And these are virtually children that really did not want to attend schools with African-American students. And so if you look at this chart of population, uh, the middle line starting from the left, which is orange, you can see when the white population begins to decline. In 1968, there was a very strong uprising or riot here in Baltimore City after the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King. You can see that actually the white population doesn't begin declining after 1968. It already began declining between 1950 and 1960. And the reason why is because there was school integration resistance. 
And that is actually what many people call white flight. But it's not simply white flight as in, oh, we want to leave just to get out of here. It was we can see that it clearly started at the time in which desegregation was mandated by the Supreme Court. And at that time, the black population, the bottom line, starting in 1940, begins to increase. There's a rapid increase uh, between 1940 and 1970, such that by 1980, African-Americans then become the majority population in Baltimore City. But that rise is attributed to something called the Great Migration. Millions of African-Americans were leaving the South many times due to loads of racial violence. Uh, there were over 4,000 lynchings in the South, the killings of African-Americans between 1877 and 1950, according to the report by the Equal Justice Institute. In that report, they actually say there were 3,959 lynchings in 12 southern states. So I arrive at that number of over 4,000 by including other states that were outside of the South where there were, in fact, lynchings as well. So that's leading to this influx of African-Americans coming out of the South, many of them also wanting to find jobs and opportunity and to get away from racial terror while the white population is really trying to leave the city. So massive demographic transition taking place uh, in the middle of the last century. And so thank you for joining this session of this presentation. We will be back shortly with serial forced displacement where we'll discuss those policies.